I guess uh, since I'm first, I'll, I'll go ahead and re up Howard's question from the last press conference. Um, is it time to start talking about talking about tapering yet? Have you and your colleagues had any conversations to those effect? Thanks. Thank you. So, no, it is not time yet. Uh, we've said that we would let the public know when it is time to have that conversation. And we'd said we'd do that well in advance of any actual decision to taper our asset purchases, and we will do so. In the meantime, we'll be monitoring progress toward our goals. All right, today is Sunday, May 2nd. This is a market recap for the week that was and an outlook for the week to come. Apologies for the absence the last few days. I was being held hostage in a bunker at the Federal Reserve, but here we are, free at last. However, all kidding aside, this will be the last episode in this format. We're not going anywhere but I will change the format of the program starting this upcoming week. So stick around for the conclusion of this video for an important note. Let's talk about the week that was. We had three main events. Number one, corporate earnings, specifically from big cap technology stocks, Apple, Microsoft, and the likes. The second main event was the speech from Fed Chairman Jerome Powell. And the third event is the speech from President Biden and his upcoming taxation policy. The first event, which is corporate earnings, came out as expected. Pristine, one of the best earnings we have received in years. It's not a surprise to anyone given the massive amount of stimmies thrown all over the place. The only problem is the reaction of the market upon announcing these earnings. The market did not receive those numbers with open arms. Certain stocks, the likes of Facebook and Google, managed to rally. But the big ones, Microsoft and Apple, did not react as positively. And the most concerning reaction was of Apple. Apple gaining around 3% after the earnings announcement, only to give up all of these gains and then some the very next day. So the question is, has the market reached peak earnings, where this is as good as it's going to get, and the picture will not be as impressive from this point on. And was the market reversal on Thursday and Friday legitimate? Would it stick? Which leads us to the second main event because the market processed corporate earnings and said, yes, they're good. However, beside the peak earnings concerns, we have two other worries that are starting to take center stage. Number one, inflation. Number two, taxation. That leads us to the second and third main events for this week. Let's start with the second, the Federal Reserve decision to keep rates as they are, and the speech from Chairman Jerome Powell, in which the man proved himself once again to be a delusional, out-of-touch maniac who's going to continue to let inflation rise higher and higher and higher. For now, he continues to deny, 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 and downplay the inflation that we see all around us getting out of control. And even if inflation continues to rise higher, the man keeps saying that it will be transitory without offering any insurance or any guarantees that inflation will be indeed transitory. His only insurance policy is that I got the tools if inflation is not transitory. By tools, he means tapering and raising interest rates, aka ending the party. And this is what the market is looking forward to. Remember last year when the economy was in shambles and the perma pigs continued to say, well, yes, the market is rising higher, but the market is looking forward beyond COVID. It. And this is why you're seeing this massive rally. Well, shouldn't the same apply now when the market quote unquote looks forward, it is seeing monetary tightening on the horizon. In essence, what Mr. Powell said is that he will be reactive, not proactive when it comes to inflation, meaning that he will only react after inflation gets out of hand. And at that point, we should cross our fingers and hope that his quote unquote tools will fix the problem, meaning that for us traders and investors, we should now double down on our inflation bets. And the reason is that this madman will allow inflation to get out of hand, out of whack, creating massive, massive problems 
For the stock market, massive shortages all over the place, perhaps even starvation, as we continue to see food prices rising higher. The last time food prices risen higher, back in 2011 and 2012, we saw the Arab Spring and lots of political destabilization around the world. The Federal Reserve and other central banks' policies could indeed unlock global chaos by allowing inflation, specifically food prices, to explode higher. And when we talk about the upcoming tapering after inflation gets out of hand, and that could happen sooner than many of us expect. The ramifications for the federal government, the fiscal side, will be that the reliance on the monetary policy will diminish, meaning that the federal government will have to increase taxes. And therefore, we're seeing announcements after announcements after announcements from the Biden administration regarding increasing taxes. And for now, they're targeting the wealthy. However, targeting the wealthy alone and raising taxes on them will not be sufficient to close the budget deficits and gaps. It will require increasing taxes across the board, including on the middle class. So these are the dynamics that the market is processing and debating. At least from the reaction this week, the market is not looking at the half full side of the glass. The market is looking at the half empty side of the glass. And if that continues, we will perhaps see a market correction very imminently. We will talk about that and a lot more during the coverage of the various segments of this program. But for now, let's start by covering the market's performance on Friday. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the red, down 185.51 points or a decline of 0.54%. The Nasdaq leading the declines for the day down 119.86 points or a decline of 0.85%. The S&P 500 also down 30.30 points or a decline of 0.72%. And notice the blue meter of the relative volume and that is increasing across the board for the Dow, for the S&P 500, and now for the Nasdaq. We talked about the low volume phenomenon of overnight pumping the market higher. You saw all of these gaps a few weeks ago, very little resistance on the upside, which was classic market manipulation via passive investing inflow. And at that time, we talked about an upcoming reversal of that action once we see the volume picks up once again. And we are starting to see that happen in the market already. What about the sector's performances on Friday? Friday, leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal utilities at number two for the silver real estate. We don't have a third place or a bronze medal to give because consumer cyclicals closed at number three, yet it closed negative for the day. And leading the decliners on Friday, energy, basic materials, and technology. Now, let's contrast that with the weekly picture of the sector's performance. Leading the pack for the week at number one and capturing the gold medal happens to be the decliner on Friday, energy at number two for the silver, communication services, thanks to Google and Facebook, and number three for the bronze, financials. Meanwhile, leading the decliners, for the week, technology decisively. Bad week for tech due to the negative reaction from earnings when it comes to Apple, Microsoft, and the software names that reported this week. What about the advanced to decline ratio for the New York Stock Exchange on Friday? 24% advancing versus 74% declining. Decisive down day for the NYSE. What about the NASDAQ? The Nasdaq 29% advancing versus 67% declining. Also a decisive down day, however, slightly better than the NYSE. Moving on to the performance of futures on Friday. Starting with crude oil, we saw a massive pop higher for the dollar index, which was anticipated by the way, and we talked about that pop before it happened during the last episode. And now we're seeing the pop happening in the US dollar. What are the most sensitive commodities when it comes to the US dollar. Number one, oil. Number two, copper. Number three, grains. And number four, to a certain extent, gold. However, gold has not been tracking the US dollar movement because the movement in yields is having more impact on the movement in gold, at least as of late. But here it is, the US dollar rising higher, therefore you're seeing oil declining for the day. Big down day for the WTI, a little over 2% declines. But the biggest loser, crude oil Brent, 
down over 3% for the day. What about softs? No stop in sign for the massive surge in lumber futures. Another day, more gains for lumber. We also saw sizable gains for cotton and sugar futures. Meanwhile, the declines in softs futures led by coca massive down day for coca futures and when that happens we see declines in coca prices that is good for names like hershey's for example likewise coffee and oj futures also closing in the red what about metals gold silver stable for the day even though we saw the us dollar surging higher and the reason is bonds were stable yields initially went down after the speech from Jerome Powell only to bounce higher the very next day. And the bounce should have continued to go higher and higher because we received very inflationary macroeconomics data, which we'll go through during the headlines of the day segment. But once again, if there is liquidation in the stock market, if there is outflow, as we saw at least in the NASDAQ this week, then that outflow, some of it at least, will become inflow for bond prices and therefore pushing yields a little lower and therefore stabilizing the action in yields and that in turn is also creating muted action for gold and silver however the us dollar rose higher on friday therefore you're seeing declines for copper in addition to palladium on the other hand platinum futures managed to close in the green a little over half a percentage point. What about meats? Lean hogs, aka the new big tech. No stop in sign here. The piggies will continue to fly higher and higher and higher. Unless you can print 3D pigs in a lab, the prices of lean hogs will continue to surge higher. The Chinese love their hogs. We have a massive shortage in hogs due to the African swine fever and the supply being crunched here in the United States. Yet we saw declines for feeder cattle futures while live cattle futures remain stable. What about grains futures? We know that grains are in a super thankful and we are seeing a massive short squeeze at least in corn. Therefore, even though the US dollar rose higher on Friday, grains actually managed to gain because you have to remember, yes, the US dollar has a significant impact on the prices of uh, commodities. However, commodities are also traded based on demand and supply. And we have a massive surge in demand regarding grains but the supply is simply not here. And therefore, grains prices continue to surge higher. I am long corn futures, and I gave you a list of names, agricultural names, in the stock market that are also riding higher based on the thupathanko in commodities. Big upside day across the board, with exception of rough rice and canola futures, which were muted on Friday. Moving on to the options market, the big casino, and let's see what's going on here. The volume surged higher for Apple and Tesla at least. We see Apple trading at number one with a little over 1.7 million contracts. About 66% of those were calls. They're basically betting that yes, Apple might have acted negatively after earnings, but we will soon see a rebound and the name will trade higher. So we'll, we'll take a look at the chart during the technical analysis and see where is the next support level for Apple. What about Tesla at number two with a massive surge in volume, about 1 million contracts, 51% of those were calls. And there were accusations that Tesla stock was manipulated on Friday. I mean, the stock is a Ponzi scheme to begin with, but there was market manipulation to push Tesla stock higher. Specifically, somebody was buying these 700 calls expiring on Friday aggressively to push the stock higher for whatever reason. And actually, Tesla managed to close in the green. It was one of the few names that managed to close in the green decisively during Friday's action. I will show you the trade during the charts analysis. But here it is at number three, NEO, with a little over 688,000 contracts. About 67% of those were calls. What about the unusual trades that took place in the options market on Friday? Let's start with the ticket LVS. This is for Las Vegas Sands. If you are betting on a reopening for Las Vegas, well, MGM already went to the stratosphere. So the next name, which happens to be the value name in casinos, Las Vegas Sands, I continue to be 
bullish on this name even though they have now become a pure Asian play because they sold their Las Vegas properties. Anyhow, we have a bullish bet here by buying the 75 calls expiration date June 4th. With expectations that the name will rise over 22.5% by then, they paid about 20 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about half a million dollars. And here we have many trades for the Qs the Nasdaq but we will concentrate on the third trade which happens to be bearish because it is the most unusual and boldest they're buying the 280 puts expiration date July 16th with expectations that the name will decline over 17 percent by then they paid about two bucks and ten cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about two million dollars what about the trade for the XBI this is the biotech ETF the biotech sector has been lagging the market perhaps it is the only laggard so far year to date so is there a bounce coming up in the horizon this is at least what this trade is saying by buying the 150 calls expiration date may 28th with expectations that the name will rise over 10 percent by then they paid about 75 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars what about the ticker spy for the s p 500 we have another bearish bet here by buying the 387 puts expiration date may 28th with expectations that the spy will decline over seven percent by then they were willing to pay a buck and 55 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about 1.4 million dollars and notice the increase of bearish bets against the market most of these bearish bets are actually insurance once we see the rate of buying insurance increasing that is always an alarming signal for an upcoming correction it happened last year in january and again in february yet the market continued to surge higher and higher all-time highs all-time highs and then we saw the massive crash the massive correction the insiders buy their protections early what about the trade for the ticker a r k k k k this is the ARK Invest Kathy Wood ETF. And I believe with the gambling habits of Kathy Wood now becoming clearer for everyone to see, it is not a surprise that we are seeing massive bets against Kathy Wood, that her ETFs will blow up and that will be the catalyst for one hell of a crash in the stock market. In this case, they're making a short-term bearish bet against the RKK by buying the 114 puts expiration date May 7th with expectations that the name will decline over five and a half percent by then they paid about 80 cents a piece to enter this trade which brought the total entry cost for this trade to about four hundred thousand dollars what about the trade for the ticker dash for DoorDash? DoorDash is one of those names the johnny come lately to the ipo market because this is a stay-at-home play we are now transitioning to the reopening phase in which DoorDash will become less sexy and therefore i I am shorting the name and so far this has been one of my most successful shorts this year and somebody's betting for more pain to come for DoorDash by buying the 133 puts expiration date May 7th with expectations that DoorDash will decline over 7% by then they paid about one buck and 75 cents a piece to enter the street all in all bringing the total to about eight hundred and seventy five thousand dollars lastly what about the trade for the ticker F sly for fastly another bearish bet here by buying the 60 dollars puts expiration date may 7th with expectations that the name will decline over six percent by then they paid about two bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about 1.2 million dollars moving on to the headlines that shape the day we will stick to the macroeconomic news this time around starting with what else tool man tool man papa jerome took the podium on wednesday and spew a lot of bullshit no surprise to anyone the man continues to deny 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 and then if denial doesn't work distort 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 and if distort doesn't work he'll just uh, shed his pants and say whoops we did it again sorry my term is expiring anyways and uh, you guys look for another fed chairman to fix the mess this is a madman with no vision with no even understanding of the ramifications of his actions all of what he's interested 
invested in. And this is, by the way, the Federal Reserve's doctrine. They keep saying our public mandate is employment and inflation. Yet the real mandate for the Federal Reserve is to protect, preserve, prop up, and inflate the assets of the wealthy, stocks, and real estate. Actions speak louder than words. The Federal Reserve's action for over a decade now only succeeded to achieve this objective. Now, Jerome Powell took the stand on Wednesday, saying, where is inflation? I don't see inflation. The CPLI formula that we use says that inflation is at 1.5%, below our target of 2%. Therefore, we're going to wait. We're not going to do any tapering or any tightening action until the CPLI shows a reading over 2% persistently to the point where inflation averages at 2%. Yet Jerome Powell doesn't have a formula to make sure that the overshoot over 2% is too much or too little. He's just gonna eyeball it. Rest assured, he got it covered. Papa Jerome got you back, put your blindfold on, go back to the casino, and continue to gamble. And hey, if inflation gets out of hand, it's just going to be transitory. He kept saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And if you are playing a drinking game, you take a shot every time he says transitory, you probably have liver damage by now. And then, of course, if it is not transitory, I got the tools, bro. Is that what you say to your wife, Mr. Powell? Honey, I can't get a hard on, but it is transitory. And if it is not transitory, I got the tools for that. Well, Mr. Powell, the economy doesn't work the same way it works in your bedroom. There is no no such thing as a transitory inflation. Now, you can twist the facts and say, oh, even the Weimar inflation was transitory. Yes, every inflation is transitory. Even the great inflation of the 1970s was transitory. In the grand scheme of things, it just lasted a decade or so. That was transitory, just for a decade. And then it subsided. Once again, propaganda and bullshit, no truth whatsoever. What do you mean by transitory? Two months? Two weeks? Two years? Because the length of quote-unquote transitory is pivotal, wouldn't you say, Mr. Powell? But here comes his newest trick. Forget about transitory. Here comes the new one. And by the way, listen to this carefully. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. Um, you said a few weeks ago that it would take a string of months of job creation of about a million to achieve progress towards your goal. Um, can you define what your what your definition of a string of months is more specifically? And on inflation, um, the FOMC said the rise in inflation we're beginning to see largely reflects transitory factors, as you just described. Uh, but why use the word largely? And what are the factors driving higher prices that may not be transitory based on the initial data that you're seeing? So what is a string? What did I mean by a string? Well, I would say what we have right now is one really good uh, I can tell you what it's not. It's not one really good employment reading, which is what we got in March. We got close to a million jobs uh, in March and a very strong labor market reading. And I was just suggesting that we'd want to see more like that. We're eight and a half million jobs below where we were in February of 2020, and that doesn't account for growth in the labor force and growth in the economy, the trend we were on. So we have, we're a long way from our, our goals, and we don't have to get all the way to our goals to taper asset purchases. We just need to make substantial further progress. It's going to take some time. Um, on, uh, on largely, you know, there, there are a bunch of factors. I, I, I was really thinking, we were thinking of, um, of the base effects and also the energy effects. I wasn't meaning to say there are some real effects. I mean, there are always, there are always relative prices going up and down within inflation. You know, there's a basket for CPI or PCE. There are, you know, many, many, many factors that go into it. Relative prices are always moving up and down. Uh, this, this we, would, we think it's, it's very fair to say that the increases we see and, frankly, are about to see later this week are largely uh, due to base effects. Um, it would have been more contentious to say entirely due to base effects because there are some things that are always going up, and so we just said largely. The first word is largely. Before it was transitory. Now it is largely transitory. Then in the next FOMC meeting, they will say, oh, it is just a medium transitory. Then it's small transitory. Then it's ex-small transitory. Then holy shit, we f***.
up and inflation is here to stay the other term that will continue to be repeated over and over and over again not just from the federal reserve but also from their propagandists over at the news media base effects forget about the readings of inflation don't be seduced by them because they're just base effects you know like when the cop stops you for driving too recklessly takes your blood alcohol level and it is through the roof sir i gotta take you and book you in jail because you cannot drive under this condition. Hey, officer, my blood alcohol level might be too high, but if you consider my Irish genes, those are just uh, base effects. And by the way, I thought that the CPI inflation data and the jobs report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics are supposed to be sealed, that even the President of the United States doesn't have access to these numbers. So how the hell did Jerome Powell get those numbers? Because he said that yes, the upcoming CPI report will show an increase in inflation but those are just base effects in other words mr powell got access to the cpi report ahead of time and he is already throwing cold water on the report because despite all of the cooking that is going to take place from the bureau of labor statistics they will not be able to hide the fact that the cpi core inflation is exploding higher so now the next trick is to distort and deceive by using quote-unquote base effects it's just base effects at this point the man looks like a clown because he's trying so hard making a fool out of himself unleashing what could be a weimar like inflation globally not just in the united states for what just to keep the stock market propped up higher until his wall street overlords say yo jerome it's time to end the party we made enough please crash the market on the tops of the heads of the zombies of the retail crowd and mom and pops for now powell doesn't have the signal so he continues to make an ass hat out of himself unleashing more and more and more inflation because he did not get the get-go from his wall street overlords powell says that if the labor market was tight wages should be rising therefore there is no inflation what are you talking about because remember what i told you before they will tolerate commodities inflation they will tolerate housing inflation they will tolerate diapers inflation they will tolerate tampons inflation but one thing they will not tolerate is wage inflation god forbid your wages start to catch up with inflation no 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 no, no. we gotta end the party right Right there but wage inflation i don't know if jerome powell is blind or deaf or whatever his problem is but wage inflation is already happening with companies offering bonuses more incentives and even hiking the minimum wage beyond 15 percent and the reason is they're having a hard time finding workers because workers are receiving benefits and the benefits they're receiving pay them more than working the minimum wage and therefore to incentivize these workers to come out of their homes and work these shitty jobs you gotta pay them more than they're receiving right now and that is pushing the minimum wage above not just 15 bucks an hour but 20 bucks an hour and i showed you a lot of facts in the previous videos regarding wage inflation from different companies and now we have the restaurant industry struggling to find workers because the demand is surging as you can see from this uh, data out of open table in certain states we are seeing a recovery in reservation exceeding pre-pandemic levels meaning that restaurants are desperately looking for workers there are no workers to be found for 10 bucks an hour they gotta hike it up to 15 bucks an hour if they can't find workers at 15 bucks an hour they have to go all the way to 20 bucks an hour and now it becomes a competition where public companies in the restaurant industry are able to hike up wages above 15 bucks an hour even 20 bucks an hour and that will become the standard for any restaurant to be able to hire workers they have to pay a minimum of 20 bucks an hour now what does that mean the cost has to be passed all the way to the end customer meaning the diners you and i this is inflation but jerome powell keeps saying oh where is inflation is it here is it there i don't see inflation and now we have merchants suing the federal reserve over debit card fees because they're getting squeezed from wages and incentives they're getting squeezed from input prices and now they're getting squeezed by fees over debit cards charged by visa and mastercard and now they're suing the federal reserve saying enough is enough are we going to be able to run a business at some point or not 
Of course, the shortage of labor is not just happening due to incentives from the stimmies, but it also happening because the new generation figured out how to cheat the system and not be beholden to corporate slavery. They're now doing Twitch, they're doing Roblox, they're doing OnlyFans, they're doing Robin Hood. Of course, those who are doing Twitch, Roblox, and uh, OnlyFans, they pretty much reach their independence, unless, of course, these stupid trends reverse. But for now, there is no reversal inside. The Robin Hoodiots, on the other hand, that is not sustainable because if the market crashes, all of their paper gains go out of the window. But for now, the new generation needs more incentives to go out there and work traditionally because they have a lot of options now that were not available not years ago, not even two years ago, but pre pandemic. New opportunities opened and they're using it. People started Amazon stores, people started Etsy stores, and have reached some financial independence. Therefore, wage pressures will continue to go higher. But it's not just the Federal Reserve that continues to deny inflation almost to a comical level. It is the whole cabal of central banking, those satanic organizations. They're all in cahoots with the propaganda of denying, distorting, and avoiding talking about inflation. Here we have the ECB in response to a question, and this is quite laughable if it wasn't sad. Because here it is. The ECB says price changes of particular goods are not the same as general inflation. I just lost a brain cell right there. We're currently seeing price increases for some goods like lumber, which may eventually be transmitted to consumer prices. It has already transmitted to consumer prices you donkeys, depending on their weight in the consumption basket. Well, the last time I checked on the weight of my wood, it is pretty f***ing heavy. And here it is, you morons. Soaring lumber prices add 36000 to the cost of a new home, and fierce land grab is making it worse. But the ECB says it might, it might translate to additional cost to consumer prices. There is no might, baby. Here it is. It is happening as we speak right now, and there is no stop in sign for the housing mania. A gauge of U.S. pending home sales rose less than forecast in March signaling a lack of available properties is keeping some buyers sidelines meaning that the demand is still here but the supply is nowhere to be found and it is becoming a full-blown hysteria dozens of hopeful silicon valley home buyers camped in tents overnight in hopes of nabbing a 1.2 million townhouse i'm willing to be homeless for a day or two sleeping in a tent in hope of overpaying all in cash for a garbage house that's probably not even worth a quarter of the asking price what about energy prices well oil is abundant around the world but here it is and that ties up to wage inflation and the shortage of labor there is not a looming shortage of crude oil or gasoline but there is a shortage in tanker truck drivers needed to deliver the gas to stations who are in short supply meaning that the incentives and the wages for these jobs will increase higher not just for new employees because they're looking for new truckers but the current truckers who are driving right now will say well we need increases too you can hike up the wages for new truckers you might as well hike our own wages why not and that adds to wage inflation all of that is being passed down to the end customer california gasoline prices rose to four bucks a gallon for the first time in a year and a half as pandemic restrictions ease and more motorists hit the road now, the state of California has insane taxes on gasoline prices, and the government refused to issue any relief because that ties up to their quote-unquote green agenda. But perhaps they should issue some relief to the population suffering from inflation because the finances of California were in shambles. But thank you to the stock market mania, California is back in the green, baby, flush with cash and ready to waste all of that cash in more deadbeat programs and more stimmies. Instead of creating jobs, perhaps pouring more money on the problems like homelessness will magically fix the problem. What about copper prices with the EV mania going on? An electric car contains 80 kilograms of copper, which is at least four times that of a fossil fuel vehicle. Demand for copper from the power and automotive sectors will increase at a compound annual growth rate of 7% to 5.2 million tons by 2030. Hello once again to the Thupathaco 
in copper. And I have been bullish copper since last year. I've been saying copper prices will explode higher over and over and over again. And I bought the stock of Freeport McMoran when it was dirt cheap, while everybody was distracted by the mania in the technology names, Neo, Plug Power, all of that garbage that came down crashing this year. Meanwhile, the super cycling commodities, in this case copper, continues to go on. What about corn prices? Here it is. Why the rally for corn, soybeans, and wheat likely isn't over. China's appetite and a short squeeze at play. In April, officials at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Beijing forecast China's corn imports for the 2020-21 marketing year at a record 28 million metric tons, with a quote-unquote continued feed demand and supply deficit. Contributing to the estimate increase, that was a sharp increase from October when the USDA forecasted China's global corn imports for the marketing year at just 7 million metric tons. So the number 28 million metric tons is four times the estimate of 7 million metric tons, meaning that the rally in corn is going to continue to go on and on and on. China's global wheat imports have essentially doubled from 5.4 million metric tons last year to a forecasted 10.5 million metric tons for the marketing year ending May 31st. China's hoarding commodities, and that is contributing to their prices surging higher. China's purchasing wheat, ethanol, and other commodities in quote-unquote fairly significant quantities, with uh, soybean inventories somewhat depleted and prices elevated, China is still importing aggressively. Corn, wheat, and soybean prices can absolutely run higher. Meanwhile, commercial traders, which include producers, add near-record net short. So a short squeeze is adding fuel to the corn rally. As funds buy, they are squeezing shorts out of positions, and this could take prices much higher than fair value. But the morons over at Reddit, the Wall Street bets, they're looking at GameStop, Microvision, whatever garbage they come up with, creating a short squeeze for a day or two. You want a sustainable short squeeze? Look no further than commodity prices. What about chicken? You like chicken? I like chicken, but it's gonna get more expensive. America's fried chicken restaurants are starting to run short on chickens. Even garbage bags are going to start to cost you a lot more. Clorox is planning to increase prices for its Glad products in July, and more hikes could be on the way. For the more, here's from uh, Colgate. The Fed says inflation increase is quote-unquote transitory, but Colgate CEO says he does not see high commodity costs abating anytime soon. I trust the CEOs, not the propagandist. And now we have a shortage in vehicles. And you heard it from Ford's earnings. The automaker expects to produce 50% fewer vehicles in the second quarter. And that big number sent shares tumbling. And Ford is not going to be alone, by the way. The shortage in vehicles will be across the board. And that will cause used vehicle prices to surge significantly higher. What about the people who used their pools during the pandemic as a source of income? Well, I got bad news for you because this family started renting out their swimming pool during the pandemic and made 50 grand. Here is the problem. They will use $49,999 out of their gains to clean up all the chlamydia in the pool because... Here it is. Chlorine supplies are running low due to a fire at a chemical plant in Louisiana last August that was damaged by Hurricane Laura. As a result, prices for tabs have skyrocketed. Now, we covered the chip shortage, and the chip shortage, in part, is happening due to a fire in Japan and the deep freeze that took place earlier in the year in Texas. So we have all of these uh, weird activities happening, causing the shortage to become even more severe. And of course, with all the stimmies, we have a massive pent-up demand that is about to be unleashed into the economy, causing more and more inflation. Now people are using their credit cards to book travels aggressively, meaning that we will see ticket prices rising higher and jet fuel prices rising higher. And there is no stop in sign for the demand side. Remember, the gap between supply and demand, this is the core of the problem. You gotta stop the demand at some point to allow the supply to catch up. There is no stop in sign for the demand, because here it is. Personal income and spending rose 21.1% and 4.2% respectively in March. And the levels of personal income and 
personal savings remain highly elevated, meaning that we have not seen the bulk the majority of the pent-up demand that is about to flood the economy. And this is, by the way, not just an American phenomenon. This is a worldwide phenomenon. The savings rate is surging significantly across the globe because every central bank is following the footsteps of the Federal Reserve. And of course, the consumer is highly confident the demand will continue to be higher so long as the consumer remains highly confident. What will shake the consumer confident? It could be a crash in the stock market, it could be a pop in the housing bubble, and therefore, critics of the Federal Reserve are urging the Fed to start tapering now because, yes, you will create a market correction, perhaps 10, 20 percent, but that will shake out the excesses in consumer confidence, reducing the demand a little bit and allowing the supply side to catch up with the demand and therefore tampering inflation expectations. But if the Fed continues in their current framework, that inflation will get out of hand and they will be reactive, not proactive. They will react to the disaster after it happens. The Q1 GDP consumption blowout suggests that the fiscal stimulus was a roaring success. With households saving rate at 21%, they are still flush with cash and that will allow them to boost spending on services without needing to pull back too much on goods. There is no stop in sign for demand. And then we got the Chicago PMI on Friday, and it was a blowout number, signaling an economy that is heating up significantly. The Chicago PMI rose to 72.1 in April, the highest level since 1983. The estimate was 65, and the prior reading was 66.3. So this reading is significantly higher. And by the way, the correlation between the Chicago Chicago PMI and the core CPI is very strong, meaning that if the Chicago PMI has surged higher, core CPI will follow, despite the cooking. The last time the Chicago PMI prices index was here, the Fed's funds rate was 22%. But, 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 but what about the deflationary forces, bro? Here is your deflationary forces. One of the arguments, at least the strongest one, for disinflation is Amazon. Because Amazon continues to keep prices low via their vast supply chain and their pricing power. But that is also fading away. Still worried about inflation? Keep an eye on Amazon. Wage wars could be brewing in the e-commerce world as the nation's second biggest employer sees higher pay as its next chance to dominate and perhaps reshape the marketplace. Amazon, Walmart, Target, all of them will get into a wage war to attract the best workers. Amazon took the initiative by raising its own minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. Walmart responded, then come Target, and now they're gonna keep hiking these wages higher and higher and higher to attract more workers. But the chairman says, where is wage inflation? I don't see any wage inflation. Is the man blind, deaf, or is he just delusional? Jay Powell describes some markets as frothy, but suggests the bulk of it isn't driven by low rates. I won't say it has nothing to do with monetary policy, but also it has a tremendous amount to do with vaccination and reopening of the economy. So this hypocrite wants to take credit for the recovery in the jobs market and the recovery in the economy overall, but he doesn't take the blame for the frothiness in the stock market and assets prices. He says, oh, just the vaccination and the reopening of the economy. Really? The man is delusional and in complete denial. And this denial is becoming dangerous, by the way, to the point where other Fed presidents are starting to speak up, not directly criticizing Chairman Powell, but indirectly saying that we should start thinking about tapering, including Dallas Fed President Bob Kaplan aka the chairman and we don't say he's the chairman because he is an actual chairman but because due to his love for chairs he famously has the twenty-five thousand dollars chair that he sits on and talks about the plight and the struggles of the poor oh he loves that chair he's married to the chair but even Kaplan is saying we should start thinking about thinking about thinking about tapering. And the market did not like that at all. Mention the word tapering and the market will go south. Because the market has been rising not based on fundamentals or earnings. The market has been rising based on the cocaine. The cocaine is fiscal and monetary liquidity. But specifically monetary liquidity. If you cut the cocaine, the market will have a withdrawal. A revergent 
to the mean. And the mean is way below the levels we're trading at right now. And here is perhaps the most important thing that Mr. Powell said. He says we're not thinking about thinking about thinking about, but here it is. He's actually thinking about it because he said that the Fed does not need to get all the way to goals to taper, meaning that the tapering will happen sooner than you expect. If you're betting that Papa Jerome has your back and you want to continue to gamble in the casino, watch out because this guy will stab you in the back. He will let his Wall Street buddies know in advance ahead of any tapering, but he will not let you and I know ahead of time before tapering because for every seller, there has to be a buyer. They want us to be the buyer and them to be the seller. And the point here from the conference from Jerome Powell is what I got at least is double down. Double down on inflation bets, whether it is on commodities or in the bonds market, because this madman, this delusional maniac will allow inflation to get out of hand and then he will react after the fact, after the shit already hit the fan. And perhaps at that time, it will be indeed too late. More in macro news. What about tax man? Uncle Joe, here it is. Biden calls to extend the expanded child tax credit through at least 2025. And they're giving $3,000 for every child over six years old and 3,600 bucks for every child under six years old. So the stimmies keep on flowing, meaning that the demand is not going to go anywhere, anytime soon. And how are we going to pay for it? Because we cannot print forever with massive budget deficits. Here it is, increasing taxes. And for now, they're talking about the rich. Biden officially calls on Congress to raise the top marginal tax rate to 39.6% from the current 37%. And to hike the capital gains tax rate for those making 1 million or more to 39.6% from the current 20%. They say that this plan is fair and fiscally responsible. Responsible. The problem is that even with these tax hikes, the revenue will not be even close enough, not even a fraction of covering all of that spending. You're gonna have to raise taxes on the middle class to cover for all of that spending. For now, they're starting with the rich. We know that the rich have all the loopholes that they can use to not pay taxes, but the hammer is coming down from tax man on the middle class very very soon. And by the way, we have a hike for capital gains coming that's 100% sure. So if you're making millions, you might be thinking I should be selling now. Well, there is a catch, even if you sell now to capture the low rate. Because panic sellers may inadvertently trigger a 3.8% Medicare surtax on net investment income. I mean, 3.8%, that is better than 20%. So we will see a sell-off regarding capital gains taxes. And by the way, it has already started. Take a look at the list of stocks that I showed you last time around, the names that are more susceptible to selling due to capital gains increases. This week, we saw a sell-off in these specific names. More from Taxman. Biden is targeting a tax break that allows investors to keep buying and selling properties without paying capital gains. Now understand this, this is not a criticism for closing all of these loopholes and taxing the rich. The rich had it good for a very long time. It's about time for them to pay their tab. I'm just saying that all of the spending will require more taxes, not just on the rich, but on everyone eventually. And taxing the rich alone is not going to do it. And by the way, taxing the rich also has negative consequences of driving down investments and stock market sell-offs, perhaps crashes due to increased taxation. That is just the truth. It's not about my position, whether I'm supportive or against these policies. It is about the impact they will have on the market and perhaps the economy. And the most important point is whether the spending is indeed fiscally responsible or not. The answer is, in short, it's not responsible. Yes, we need infrastructure spending, but the spending has to be specific to the infrastructure, not for miscellaneous items and goodies all over the place. And by the way, the Fed chairman says, I don't see any wage hikes. I don't see any wage inflation. So we're good for now. Meanwhile, the federal government officially raised wages. So is he asleep? Is he blind? Is he deaf? Or is he just delusional? And you want to talk about socialism? Socialism is already here. A record 34% of all household income in the United States now comes from the government. Of course, people have been touting socialism as the solution for this gangster capitalist system that we have. But the truth is that the socialist system is also only benefiting the rich. With all of the spending that we're doing, stimmies and programs all over the place, magically the money floats all the way back 
to the rich in corporate America. The stock market is at all-time highs, and you saw from the earnings of Apple, for example, insane numbers, because all of the socialism done by the government, handing people cash printed out of thin air, is going all the way back in buying iPads and iPhones and benefiting the rich at the end. And if you are saying, whoa, but wait a minute, we have mansion optimism, and perhaps the Republicans will win the next time around, well, the Republicans are as just as corrupt as the Democrats are. There's no difference here. But here is the problem that you have to be prepared for. These policies are extremely popular, meaning that the Democrats perhaps will expand their lead next time around and they will be able to pass more taxation and more bills easily. But rest assured, I got some good news for you. The population is waking up and people are listening to our criticism for the Federal Reserve. Biden is being urged by activists to make potentially significant changes at the U.S. Central Bank. That sounds good, isn't it? Uh-oh, here it is. The Fed Up campaign praises Powell, but wants more done on equality, meaning they want the Federal Reserve to continue to print even more and adapt MMT openly and more aggressively. Well, never mind then, we are back at square one. Moving on to the heat map analysis, the weekly picture. Let's see what's going on here. The first thing your eyes are drawn to is the unevenness, unevenness, whatever the hell it is, but the lack of a consistent theme is what I'm trying to say, with exception to the strength in financials and energy. For example, take a look at the big cap technology names. We have Amazon, Facebook, and Google outperforming. Meanwhile, Apple and Microsoft underperforming. Likewise, in the software names, we have Shopify overperforming. Meanwhile, ServiceNow got hammered. Similar story with the chips. You have Qualcomm overperforming. Meanwhile, NVIDIA, AMD, but specifically Texas, down severely this week. Similar story with the IPOs and the mania names. You have solar names down. You have the DoorDashes, the Pinterest, Spotify, all of these down. But you also have Airbnb and Snapchat outperforming. The take here is that the market is reacting to individual earnings, rewarding names that are exceeding expectations expectations, meanwhile punishing other names that failed to meet or exceed expectations. When we talk about expectations, we're not talking about some analyst's expectation. We are talking about what is already priced in within the stock price. For example, Apple is up almost 100% year over year since the March bottom. A lot of the good results are already baked in, and therefore you're seeing the name reacting negatively. What about the themes analysis? Perhaps we can find a consistent theme by viewing these names. Starting with the reopening names, all in all, outperforming the market with gains across the board with very few exceptions. However, this week will be more decisive for the reopening names because we have a lot of names from amusement parks to restaurants to cruises and hotels reporting earnings this upcoming week. Most of these names are overbloated and pricing in a lot of the good news. So the risk versus reward is that these names will also react negatively, absent of a massive surprise to the upside. What about the inflationary trade? All in all, a green picture across the board. The inflationary trade, once again, Jerome Powell confirming that you should be doubling down on the inflationary trade, whether it's commodities, whether it's stocks, it doesn't matter because he will let inflation inflation run out of hand first and then react after the fact and therefore you're seeing gains across the board and of course dips should be bought in these names now we can adjust and tweak the list perfected as much as we can for example i'm taking a look at a name like new mount gold which should not be in this list we should replace it with Freeport McMoran. Perhaps we will do that starting tomorrow. What about the disinflationary names? Losses across the board, specifically for the high multiple names, but we have exceptions. For example, Shopify, the name got hammered ahead of time, heading into earnings. So the surprise was to the upside. You see Shopify reacting positively. But once again, if Powell will allow inflation to get out of hand and yields will explode higher, then some of these names, specifically the high multiple names, will suffer tremendously. So whatever your inflationary trade, inflationary bet is, Powell is saying double down. Whether you are buying commodities, inflationary stocks, or shorting bonds, or these disinflationary names, specifically the high multiple names, Powell is saying double down. Moving on to the charts analysis, starting with the SPY 30 minutes chart. Since the beginning of last month, 
April, I've been saying to you that the reversal in the stock market will take one of two forms. Number one, a gap and crap scenario where the stock market gaps higher overnight only to be sold off by the end of the day. And that is a very strong and solid reversal signal. The other form will be a gap lower overnight from which the market fails to recover. We saw the first scenario of a gap and crap, at least in the NASDAQ, but looking at the SPY, we almost saw a V-shaped recovery. We saw the gap, here comes the crap, and then you see the Naruto style dip buying, the morons. Oh, we have a dip, dip, put your blindfold on, run Naruto style, heads first, and buy the dip. And by the way, we're talking about algos here, because the retail Naruto, that's gone. That's old school. But right away, buying the dip in the SPY from the support of 417.30, in or around that number. But the damage has already been done from the gap and crap and you see the continuation of the negative theme all the way till Friday. The important take for this chart is the following. The SPY closed at the support pretty much of 417.30. So you cannot be overly bearish on the SPY from this chart alone. However, we have this uh, double top formation now from the gap and crap and the V-shaped recovery that followed. What does that mean? It means that we have confirmation that the SPY will not be able to suppress the level, the very important level, naturally, of 420 absent of a catalyst. What is the catalyst? Massive surprise to the upside from earnings. But what else? Let's think about positive catalysts that will take the SPY over 420. What is it? Is it inflow into the market? The inflow has already happened and now we're seeing outflow. Is it going to be monetary policy support like cutting interest rates? Of course not. We're talking about tapering. We're running out of positive catalysts to take us higher. That is the important message. Moving on to the daily chart of the continuous contract of the SPY. Now, even though this is a positive formation, we give this a thumbs down. And the reason is the market, the chart in this case, is highly extended and the indicators, the RSI and the MACD, are showing highly elevated extended levels signaling exhaustion and a potential for a negative trend to form. We already have a negative divergence in the RSI. And we have negative readings, the red impressions in the history of the MACD, signaling that the momentum that was positive a few weeks ago is starting to accelerate to the downside. And if that is the case, that the SPY should at least stall and consolidate at this range or go down all the way to the very important support of 3,960 and perhaps we will find buyers at that level. Now, why is the SPY, the S&P 500 in this case, more resilient than say the NASDAQ and the IWM. The reason is that the SPY, the S&P 500, includes financials, industrials, energy, and metals. All of these sectors are inflationary and they benefit from higher inflation expectations. And therefore, the SPY will continue to outperform even during corrections because it includes the inflationary trade. Moving on to the Qs, the NASDAQ, 30 minutes chart. We saw the gap and crap, but we did not see the V-shaped recovery that we saw in the SPY. We climbed all the way to 340, which is the resistance now formerly was the support and we got rejected we have a confirmation of a rejection from 340 meaning that the nasdaq should go lower in search of support before it is able to rebound because for now there is no support there is no momentum to push the queues to crack above 340 and we are already seeing a mini bear formation taking place you can call it a bear formation you can look at the gap and crap candle and draw a reverse abc pattern that should also take a slower the b leg ends at the rejection of 340 and now we are already forming the c leg to the downside what about the continuous contract of the nasdaq once again the market was registering all-time highs corporate earnings are explosive but i continue to maintain that we have a reversal and a pullback imminent and the reason is the market is very extended and it is already pricing in all of the good news and you are seeing the acceleration in the volume that is not a good sign for the market saying that we have lower prices to visit here for the nasdaq we have the negative divergence in the rsi we have a confirmation of the negative crossing in the macd indicator creating red impressions in the histogram and perhaps we're seeing a double top formation and that means that we're going to go all the way down to 13,599 as the first stop if we cannot find support at that level and buyers are not inter interested to buy the dip then we will go a lot lower 13,300 should be a good level for at least a short 
long-term support. What about the IWM? Small caps, 30 minutes chart. We saw the gap in crap without any V-shaped recovery in here and the chart is looking negative for now. It is still trading in range. It hasn't gotten anywhere. We have support at 223. If that fails, we have 218. Once again, the IWM is very sensitive to the reopening names. A lot of these names are going to report this week. Also sensitive to AMC and GameStop. AMC will report earnings this week. But if the reaction is negative, that should take down GameStop with it, and that should take the IWM down along with them. But what about the daily chart of the rut? the Russell 2000. Once again, the suspense keeps on going. Week four, we're waiting and waiting and waiting for the definitive reaction and breakout from the consolidation at the level of 2,264. My bet is to the downside, but the market managed to close above 2,264 by the end of the week, just slightly, and fixing some of the negative divergence. So for now, on paper, the bulls have the advantage. But once again, this is a very exhausted, very extended chart and it is looking for a correction it needs a correction and the correction in the russell 2000 after the massive run since the elections in november will be extremely severe what about the dollar index last time around we talked about a massive pop higher imminent in the u.s dollar that indeed happened on friday and it is signaling that there is appetite to raise cash selling stocks and staying on cash for a little while perhaps buying some bonds, and that pushed yields a little lower. But the US dollar is reversing, and perhaps it can go all the way to 92, and if the sell-off accelerates in the stock market, we could see another leg higher for the US dollar, perhaps surpassing 92. What about gold? What's going on here? Gold remains muted, not moving as much, because gold is waiting for yields to move lower. But yields remain choppy and elevated from last week's levels. We're now reading decisively over 1.6%. And gold is not liking that. Gold is waiting for a definitive move in yields up or down before making its next move. If yields, for whatever reason, explode higher, and we know what the reason is, more and more inflationary data. And if that is the case, then gold will reverse and trend lower. But if we see a sell-off in the market and an appetite to buying bonds, pushing yields lower, then that will also be good for gold to rise higher. What about Bitcoin? Bitcoin remains negative remains bearish we have a bear flag formation but the challenge for the bulls here is to push the chart higher to reclaim the trend level and recheck that for support that is an extremely difficult challenge after a reversal like we saw last month the likelihood is that bitcoin should go down all the way to 42,000, and it will find plenty of support at that level. What about yields? Yields capturing the support of 1.622 basis points that I have identified for you weeks ago. We saw the pop higher only to be reversed by the speech from Fed Chairman Powell, but again bouncing from the support. The action, the behavior of the chart is saying that it is not ready to go lower. If anything, it has the momentum to surge even higher. For more clarity, let's visit the TLT bond prices. Here is a daily chart. We're still within the Fibonacci retracement levels, but showing weakness from dropping from one level to the other and closing the week below the level from which the TLT started the week. We also have a negative crossing imminent for the MACD indicator, signaling a loss of momentum from the recent bounce of the TLT. For now, the action says yields will go higher, the TLT will go lower. What about the VIX? What's going on here in the volatility index? We talked about the consolidation and the bull flag formation, and that consolidation will break out to the upside, and it is starting to break out to the upside. At some point, the VIX will be able to crack above 20. If that happens, it will unlock more gains for the VIX and more losses for the SPY. The VIX has another massive move coming. What about Apple? 30 minutes chart. You have the massive pop right after earnings, but this is a big and a significant reversal candle. Apple delivered across the board when it comes to earnings, but the market did not like the earnings at all because the market said, yes, the earnings are impressive, but perhaps we already reached a peak earnings for Apple and the good news are already baked in that perhaps the quarter was fueled by stimmy money. And we're not going to have more stimulus packages, at least to that magnitude in the next few quarters, meaning that Apple has to stand on its feet. And now that people have upgraded to iMacs and iPads and iPhones, perhaps the best 
is already behind us. And therefore, the chart fell down to the center of gravity of 131. It managed to close slightly above the support, and we will see whether this support of 131 will be sufficient enough for buyers to buy the dip in Apple. And when I say dip, I'm saying this sarcastically, because the chart has been trading in range for weeks and weeks now. There is a breakout imminent, up or down, but from the action last week, my bet is it will be to the downside. If these earnings did not impress the market regarding Apple, what will it take to impress investors to push Apple's stock higher? I don't know, like the upcoming European regulations against Apple. Apple has a new software and small businesses and big businesses alike. The app developers are screaming foul. They're saying that Apple is a monopoly and it is bullying app developers for more cash and more fees. And therefore, we call Apple the iMob. What about Tesla, the souffle? What's going on here? Somebody is watching the Maverick of Wall Street's channel and figured out that the line in the sand is 679. The chart was distant to close below 679 for the week. And they decided to do a cute trick of creating a short-term gamma squeeze by buying the 700 calls aggressively for whatever reason. Perhaps they already had calls that they bought prior to earnings and now they're losing money and they have to manipulate the price action higher to get out of these positions who knows? But there was a lot of funny business on Friday regarding Tesla. It is weird that Tesla was the only name closing in the green decisively where the market was down for the most part. But for now, nothing happened from the closing on Friday. The negative divergence in the RSI persists and we have red impressions in the histogram signaling a loss of momentum. Yes, the chart closed above the line in the sand, but it is below the support of 720. My bet is absent of a catalyst of new news, Tesla will reverse the movement from Friday. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar this week? On Monday, we have the manufacturing PMI and ISM indicators. The assumption is that the the number will be very hot, but the most important thing to watch is prices paid and their implications on inflation. Then on Tuesday, we have factory orders, and on Wednesday, we have the ADP employment report. My bet is that this number will come extremely hot, perhaps surpassing 1 million. If that is the case, yields will explode higher. Then we have the services PMI and ISM. Those are going to be very important, but again, prices paid is the number to watch. On Thursday, we have, per usual, the weekly jobless claims. And then on Friday, we have the big number, the big jobs report. Remember what Jerome Powell keeps saying. Yes, last month, the number was impressive, over 1 million. But we need to see more reports showing improvement in the labor market, more readings over 1 million. That will incentivize the Federal Reserve to start tapering. So if we get a reading of over 1 million, once again, you bet that we will see massive action in the bonds market and yields could explode higher, all the way to 1.8%, perhaps even 2%. Once again, if that is the case, we will see a massive sell-off in the stock market because the market will start taking tapering a lot seriously if we get another reading above 1 million. So the cooks at the Bureau of Labor Statistics once again will be extremely busy. What about the earnings calendar? We have a lot of names reporting starting with Lowe's on Monday. Then on Tuesday, we have CVS, Pfizer, and T-Mobile. Wednesday, we have General Motors, Emerson, PayPal, and Uber. Thursday will be the most important day by far with names like Moderna, Regeneron, Penn National Gaming, AMC, Plug Power, Expedia, Peloton, Viacom, Wayfair, Square, Ruko, Norwegian Cruises, all reporting. An extremely important day on Thursday. Then on Friday, we have Nikola and DraftKings. We will go through these charts, some of them at least, during tomorrow's video. And that leads us to the important change that is about to happen in this channel. When I started this channel, it started as a hobby. I'm a part-time YouTuber not a full-time one. It started as a hobby to share my analysis and my commentary regarding the market and also documenting this bubble. If you try to find any documentation for, say, the dot-com bubble, good luck to you. You're not going to find any solid documentation of the day-to-day -day action and market sentiment. This channel has the most comprehensive coverage of any other channel on YouTube covering the market's events day by day from a macroeconomics perspective, 
from a sentiments perspective, from a policy perspective, all the information and the documentation for this bubble is here in this channel. Now, the problem is, given the situation right now, producing this content and maintaining the quality has become extremely exhausting to me and time consuming. I produce an hour show every night but it takes me hours to produce this content and therefore i have come to the conclusion that this is unsustainable even though this is my preferred format because as i said my goal is to provide a comprehensive coverage of the stock market technical analysis is important most youtubers do technical analysis that is important as I said, but it is just one component of what you need to know about the market. You have to combine all the information. And I like to have a one hour show with the flow of information being continuous. But as I said, this is not sustainable for now. And therefore, starting this upcoming week, the show will be divided into two segments. Number one, and this is the first video, you'll get it earlier. It will cover the market's performance, futures, options, the heat map analysis, and the technical analysis. I can do that quickly, produce those videos so you can have them earlier and not have to miss all of this information by watching it the very next day when the market action and trading has already took place. Then after I finish my own personal work, I will have the time pressure free to produce the headlines of the day segment where we cover macroeconomics news, sentiment news, and corporate specific news. And that includes my commentary. And by the way, this happens to be your favorite segment, the audience. You guys like the headlines of the day segment, and therefore that will be a separate video. So once again, starting tomorrow, you will get a video earlier covering the market's information. And then later in the evening, you will get another video for the headlines of the day segment. So you'll have two videos per day. I will beta test this format for the month of May. And if it is successful, we'll continue with this format from this point on. And let's be honest, most of us have ADHD. We cannot even concentrate for two minutes straight, let alone one hour. And therefore, cutting the program into two segments could help the channel retain its viewership. Anyhow, let me know what you think in the comments whether you like this new format or not. I mean, you don't have any choice about it. You're just going to have to take what I give you. But your input is valuable to me. So I'd like to hear your opinion regarding this change. Anyhow, that's all I got for you tonight. And I will talk to you again tomorrow.